Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to QSI uh, seminar. Today it's, uh, it's our pleasure to invite uh, Zhicheng Zhang uh, to give it, uh, us a talk on his recent work with uh, Zhicheng Wang and Mingsheng Ying. Um, Zhicheng is from, uh, just graduated from University of Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, this is a university, uh, as you can see from the uh, title or the name of the, uh, the university, it is uh, affiliated with the uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, Zhe Cheng uh, has submitted his uh, uh, offshore enrollment um, to UTIs. He will join us uh, shortly under the supervision of Ming Sheng Ying. Uh, okay, uh, I think Zhe uh, Cheng, you can take over. Okay, uh, great. Thank you. Uh, maybe uh, you can, could you uh, increase your volume? Uh, it is okay. Um, I don't know if you can hear me now. Uh, yeah, okay, that's good. Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you, Sanjian, for this introduction, and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, today, I would like to talk about our recent work on the parallel quantum algorithm for Hamiltonian simulation. And uh, this is a joint work with Qi Sheng and Ming Sheng. Uh, Ming Sheng is also here today in the audience. Okay, uh, before I start, I should mention, uh, if you have any questions during my talk, please feel free to post me at any time. Okay, uh, let's start. Um, I would begin with the motivation of this work uh, that is faster Hamiltonian simulation. The problem in Hamiltonian simulation is probably the oldest problem in the field of quantum computing. As many of you might know, actually it is uh, one of the motivation for Feynman to propose the idea of quantum computers. Because um, many physical systems in the nature are based on rules of quantum mechanics, uh, Feynman asked whether using a quantum mechanical computers can simulate the nature more efficiently than the classical ones. The first answer to this question is by Loy's quantum simulation algorithm for local Hamiltonians, which is exponentially faster than all known classical ones. Um, you know, the local Hamiltonians includes many physical Hamiltonians of interest because uh, in physics, many Hamiltonians are um, actually involves local interactions. And over the past 20 years, there are tremendous quantum algorithms for Hamiltonian simulation have been studied. Some of them even achieve optimal in certain cases. That means the complexity of these quantum algorithms match the lower bound for this task. Um, now we can ask a question can we further speed up the quantum algorithm for the simulation by introducing the parallelism? The concept of parallelism will be formalized later. Um, let's first have a brief uh, look of the problem itself. The Hamiltonian simulation problem is to uh, simulate the dynamics of a physical system according to the Schrodinger equations where here we assume the Hamiltonian that governs the system is time independent. And this is the Schrodinger equations that we all know. We start from an initial state for psi zero, then evolves for time t to arrive at the state for psi t. And the evolution unitary can be written as e to the negative i h t. Now here we assume the Planck a constant is one. Um, this problem has many applications in simulating the physical systems. Uh, for those problems appeared in condensed matter physics, high energy physics, and quantum chemistry. Um, another kind of applications of Hamiltonian simulation is the quantum algorithm for Hamiltonian simulation can be used as a subroutine in many other quantum algorithms. This includes quantum algorithms to solve the linear system, to solve the semi-definite programming problem, and uh, some quantum algorithms in the machine learning. Well, this implies this problem it has attracted researchers from very diverse fields. 
Now, uh, let's see how to characterize the complexity of a simulation algorithm. Recall our goal is to approximate the unit tree e to the negative i h t. We will call this target unit tree. But there are several parameters that will determine the complexity of, of our quantum algorithms. If the input size is fixed, then our algorithm can be specified as a quantum circuit. So we are given an input state, psi zero, and output state, psi tweedle t. Here, the tweedle stands for uh, our output state is actually an approximation of the correct output state, psi t. And uh, the precision is given by a parameter epsilon. The evolution time is given by the parameter t. Uh, and following the conventions in previous work, the Hamiltonian uh, is input into the system, is, is input by the oracle that accepts the Hamiltonian. There might be many different kinds of oracles as we will specify later. Um, so the total complexity of these quantum simulation algorithm will depend on these factors, including the simulation time t, the simulation precision epsilon, and other parameters of the h, including the size of h, that is the number of qubits in Exxon. And as in many other algorithms, the complexity will consist of query complexity and gate complexity, where the query complexity is how the number of calls to the oracle h uh, that access the h, and the gate complexity would be the additional gates that uh, you used in this quantum algorithm. Okay. Uh, now I will briefly introduce the uh, current three quantum approaches to the Hamiltonian simulation. Um, the first approach is by product formula. So we call our target unit tree is e to the negative i h t. If you can decompose h into several easy to simulate Hamiltonian, then the whole simulation can be decomposed into several uh, separate simulation for these uh, easy to simulate Hamiltonian for a short time with these approximation equations. And this approach is uh, possibly the simplest to implement. So it has also attracted attentions in recent years because uh, people are longing to uh, find application of the simulation in near-term devices. The early works in this approach often have a poor dependence, complexity dependence on the precision epsilon. And this is later improved by borrowing techniques from other approaches. As we can see later uh, in the second approach, quantum work. The co main contribution of, of this approach is to improve the complexity dependence on the precision from poly of one over epsilon to poly log of one over epsilon. This is uh, a, an exponential improvement on the epsilon dependence. And uh, the central idea of this approach is to expand the target unit into a series. Uh, so as you can see here, the T sub R of H is the degree R Chebyshev polynomial of H. And now we can think of it as a uh, operator that can be obtained from the so-called quantum work process. Once we have these operators, then we can linearly combine them with the technique of linear combination of unitary, uh, also known as LCU methods, to, uh, uh, to obtain an approximation of the target unitary. And techniques emerged in this approach is also applied to other quantum algorithms, including solving the quantum linear systems. The third approach might be the most popular today is based on quantum signal processing. Now, it basically uh, uses the idea that transforms the eigenvalues of a unit tree via controlled uh, rotations on an ancilla that called the signal that, that is coupled to the original system. And this approach has achieved optimal query complexity now. It has also spawned many powerful techniques uh, that are considered kind of standard now uh, in the Hamiltonian simulation, including qubitization, block encoding, and quantum singular value transformation. 
Today, we will not get into the detail of these approaches. Uh, I want to point out that as far as we know, all these approaches are sequential. So this implies there is still room for further speed up by parallel quantum computation. Um, now let's have an intuitive uh, illustration of the target of parallel quantum computing. So again, if the input size is fixed, then our quantum algorithm can be specified as a quantum circuit. Uh, the circuit size refers to the total number of gates involved in this quantum circuit. And the circuit depth, which is the main uh, quantities we, we need to consider in parallel computing, is describe the longest path from the input state to the output state. Now the goal of parallelization is to significantly reduce the de circuit depth of this quantum circuit by introducing some ancilla qubit. And these ancilla qubit will be measured at the end of the computation. So the input space and output space is still the same as a regional quantum circuit, but we uh, want to significantly reduce the depth of it with the cost of um, polynomial to increase the size of the quantum circuit. So this is uh, similar to the goal of classical parallel computation. In the cost of space, we uh, largely reduce the time. Now I will show you uh, our results obtaining our work. We proposed a parallel quantum simulation algorithm for a class of Hamiltonian called uniform structure Hamiltonian which is a special class of sparse Hamiltonian. And these Hamiltonians can be written in the following form as a sum of some uh, of several HW. Now, what are these HW? Uh, this can be specified by the two oracles. The first oracle uh, gives you an entry of H. This oracle is kind of standard in the uh, Hamiltonian simulation. Uh, you can specify the row J and the column K, then it will compute the entry on the row J and column K on the third quantum register. The second oracle uh, is called OP, and this is not very standard. Uh, it will give you a parameter that specifies the sparse structure of HW. That means here we are assuming each of the, uh, each HW has a special sparse structure. That means the non-zero entries in HW has a special pattern. So uh, these special pattern can be specified by a parameter SW and OP just to compute SW from W. Uh, note that these oracles differs from uh, the oracle used in previous, where, previous work. And we will see this oracle is actually natural for uh, a wide class of Hamiltonians. Uh, let's see some example of uniform structure Hamiltonian. One of the example is local Hamiltonians. Um, in this case, each HW can be written as a HPW tensor and identity. So here HPW uh, describes the interaction of a subsystem, a small subsystem, PW, while the Hamiltonian acts as an identity on the remaining system. Uh, a more concrete example would be, uh, for example, if HW acts non only non-trivially on the first and third qubit, then we can set SW to be such a bit string where its first and third bits is one. Okay. Now, the second example is Pauli sums, where H is a sum of uh, such HW, where each HW is a tensor product of Pauli matrices. So here is a concrete example. If HW has a following form, then uh, we can have a SW also as a MB string um, that describes the diagonality of these Pauli matrices. That means if 
uh, for example, if X is off diagonal, then we set the corresponding bit to one. And if identity is diagonal, we set the corresponding bit to zero. And likewise for Z and Y. So uh, although these um, Hamiltonians, the, the uniform structure Hamiltonians have, uh, have to be specially defined, it still encompasses many uh, Hamiltonians of physical interest. Okay, now I will show you the uh, main result in our paper. Uh, the first is theorem one that simulates a uniform structure Hamiltonian H, which acts on n qubits where each HW is D sparse for time T to precision epsilon by the following uh, complexity. So here the complexity includes the query complexity and gate complexity, and we only want to emphasize the complexity dependence on the precision epsilon. Here note, uh, this is color in red. The epsilon dependence of the depth is poly log log of one over epsilon. So this uh, compares to private work with a dependence poly log of one over, one over epsilon uh, impose a exponential speed up on the dependence by introducing the parallelism. Now for a clearer look of this result, we can apply it to a special case for local Hamiltonians. If H is an L local Hamiltonian, that means each HW acts only on a subsystem uh, of L qubits and these qubits positions are indicated by bit one in the uh, parameter string SW. I recall this example if HW acts non trivially on the first and third qubit, then SW has bit one on this bit. Um, now, this simulation process can be done with the following complexity. Uh, the first line is a query complexity to OH and OP, and the second line is the gate complexity for additional one, two, one or two qubit gate. Now, again, we will only emphasize the uh, uh, complexity dependence on the precision. Here we use gamma, uh, which is roughly log of one over epsilon. So in this red color, the dependence on the gamma is about uh, poly log of gamma. That means the complexity dependence on epsilon is roughly poly log of one over epsilon. Now we can compare this result to previous optimal sparse Hamiltonian simulation by Lowe and Chang. Uh, in both query and gate complexity, their dependence on the gamma is about polynomial. Um, of course, uh, their algorithms applies to more general sparse Hamiltonian, but restricted to the local Hamiltonians. Our algorithm uh, also has a speed up on the dependence on epsilon by introducing the parallelism. Now for the lower bound, uh, our work further explores the lower bound for the parallel quantum simulation. Uh, again, in Low and Chang's paper, they have proved a omega of log one of epsilon over log log one of epsilon, size lower bound for both query and gate complexity for simulating sparse Hamiltonian. Um, and in our work, we prove a new lower bound for the parallel uh, simulation for sparse Hamiltonian that is omega of log log one over epsilon. Uh, note that this is a depth lower bound for the gaze and we did not prove a lower bound for the queries. This result even holds for the uniform structure Hamiltonian simulation that uh, which implies our result for uniform structure Hamiltonian simulation cannot be significantly improved. Okay, for a better illustration of our algorithm, we apply our simulation algorithm to simulate three uh, physical models uh, of interest. These are Heisenberg model, SYK model, and a monocular model. And to apply our algorithm to this model, we need to uh, specify how we implement the oracle OH and OP. That means we need to implement these oracles by one or two qubit gates. So 
the result shown in this table only is only about the gate complexity. Um, I see a question. Okay, uh, it's not a question. <laughs> uh, as shown in the fourth column in the of this table, uh, we count the gate depths that depends on the parameter epsilon. And as you can see, uh, our algorithm achieves a epsilon dependence in the depths in, in all of these models about a uh, log, log squared, uh, log cube log one of epsilon compared to previous result, uh, which has complexity poly log one over, ep one over epsilon. So uh, this is a result for application to these models. Okay, I think uh, this is a good time to stop here to see if there's any questions. Okay, great. <laughs> if there's no question, I will go on to describe the high level overview of the algorithm. Now, uh, our quantum algorithm is based on the quantum work approach to Hamiltonian simulations. And uh, this quantum work is often now referred to as Charles quantum work. Uh, so let's get a quick review of Charles quantum work. Uh, we start from a D-sparse Hamiltonian H and with O1 Oracle queries to H, we can obtain a Charles quantum work operator Q. And if you apply this Q for all sequential steps, you can obtain a block encoding of this operator T sub of H over T, uh, H over D, where T sub of X is the degree of sharp sharp polynomial. Uh, here, the block encoding is now a standard way to uh, describe how we can implement a linear operator probabilistically. That means we are actually having a unitary U with this upper left block being the this operator, the Chebyshev polynomial of a H. Now with this poly, uh, Chebyshev polynomial, one can expand the target unitary, uh, the unitary we want to simulate, into a series of these Chebyshev polynomial if the simulation time is uh, sufficiently small. And then with uh, linear combination of unitary methods, that is LCU methods, one can uh, combine this Trebuchet polynomial into the target unitary as an approximation of this target unitary. Uh, note that here, to achieve a total precision of epsilon, we need to expand. Uh, the number of terms we need to expand should be at least the log of one of epsilon. And since the small r ranges from zero to the capital R minus one, so the total number of queries uh, to h is at least log of one of epsilon. And these queries should are sequential. So in, so in total, uh, this would induce a zeta log one of epsilon depth of queries. Now let's see how do how can we uh, parallelize this framework. We will start off from a uniform structure Hamiltonian, uh, and the main contribution of our work is to find a parallel quantum work operator Q R with the parameter R. Now this quantum operator is actually a block encoding of the uh, of the mon of a monomial of H. Here is h over md raised to the r's power. So compared to previous uh, Charles quantum work, uh, which in block encodes a Chebyshev polynomial, here we are actually block encoding, uh, block encodes a uh, monomial of h. And for similar reasons, one can decompose the target unitary into a series of monomials. That is actually the Taylor expansion. And uh, using a modified LCU, that is parallel LCU, one can combine these operators in poly log of R depths to obtain an approximation of E to the negative pi H. Now, the point is the parallel quantum work operator 
only requires a constant depth of Oracle queries. Uh, that is where the speed up come from. Now in total, uh, the depth dependence on the epsilon would be poly log log of one of epsilon. Um, next I will show you how uh, how these parallel quantum works uh, works. And there are many two points to show. The first is these newly defined parallel quantum work blocking codes and monomial of H. The second point is we can really implement this uh, parallel quantum work in parallel with only a constant depth of queries. Uh, before I go on, is there any question so far? Okay. Uh, now I will go on to the main techniques of our quantum algorithm, that is the parallel quantum work. The parallel quantum work is based on a restricted version of Charles quantum work. So let's again have a quick review of the Charles quantum work. Uh, suppose we are given an Hamiltonian H that is D sparse n by n Hamiltonian. And the Charles quantum work is a quantum work operator Q that consists of two operators S and T. Oh, Q is a unitary in an extended space uh, curly age. Oh, what are these S and T? The operator S is quite simple. It just uh, swap the first quantum register and the second one. So S can be implemented by simple swap gate. The more complicated part could be the T. Uh, it maps every computational basis to a superposition. Now, this expression might be complicated. Let's split it into two parts. The first part is a superposition that is actually an analog of the classical random walk. So that's why uh, this is called quantum walk. Um, now let's see what is this uh, unnormalized state. Uh, here we will call it good part. So if H, uh, in the classical case, if H is a transition matrix of, of a Markov chain, then it has an underlying graph that is using H as an adjacency matrix of a graph. Um, then in classical case, the transition would be transit from a vertex J probabilistically to its neighbors with a prob probability uh, in the entry of H. Now for the quantum case, we are not uh, this, uh, this vertex prob probabilistically, but um, we map J to a superposition of all these edges work out from J to its neighbors. So here, as you can see, it is actually a superposition of all the uh, outer edges from J to K, with the weight being the square root of uh, the complex conjugate on this edge. So this is an uh, analog of the classical random walk. That's denoted with as phi j. Now for this t being a unitary, uh, one needs to keep this whole state at, as a normalized state. So we add a uh, factor one over square root of d and the bad part, a garbage state. And so this garbage state will be denoted as phi j bot. The good part and the bad part has some orthogonal relations in the context of the swap operator S. This roughly implies the bad part actually does not contribute to the meaning of the work operator Q. So if you can, if you calculate each entries of Q, you would find that the upper left block is actually H over D. That means Q give us a block encoding of H over D. Now let's see how to um, parallelize these quantum work. Um, for the parallel version, 
the state the state space of this work is extended to become uh, roughly R copies of the original space. The work operator we still denoted with Q, T, and S with a parameter R, where the SR is a generalization of the swap operator. Uh, it is actually also simple. It, it, it reverse, all, reverse the order of all these quantum register. So there are in total two R plus two quantum register. It reverse the order of this quantum register. The more uh, complex part is still TR. It maps every uh, computational basis J naught to a such a superposition. Again, it can be split into two parts. Now the first part is a generalization of previous uh, quantum work. Here we only noted that uh, the bold J represents a tuple, actually a path of length R in the original graph. So say we start with the vertex J naught and we work out one step to J1. And this had a weight H J naught J1. Then we again work out uh, the second step to J2. And these, uh, this sequence of work forms a path on the original graph. And um, now the good part of this quant parallel quantum work is actually a superposition of all these paths um, starting from the vertex J naught generated by R steps of random work. Now the random work is weighted with the weight being the square root of complex conjugate of H J S J S plus one. So if you walk from J naught to J three, the weight of these paths in this superposition would be the multiplication of the square root of this weight. Uh, this is a central construction in our parallel quantum work. And with this construction, we can also add a bad part, a garbage to the state to keep TRA unitary. And they also follow some also orthogonal relations that gives you a block encoding of a monomial of H, that is H over D raised to the R's power. Now these uh, finishes the first point we want to show. Uh, we successfully obtain a block encoding of H over D uh, to the R. Now the second point is uh, to show that QR can be implemented in parallel. Now we, we will start to answer this question, how to implement QR in parallel. Uh, SR and QR is actually very simple to implement with swap gate. The harder part is again TR. Observe these states, uh, observe the target state of TR uh, that acts on the computational state J naught. There is actually an a uh, dependence chain in these paths in the bold in the bold J. So this dependence chain makes T the implementation T of TR to be sequential in its nature. Uh, let's take a careful look on this dependence chain. If you want to generate these kit J, the state kit J, uh, the bold J, one need to first uh, start from the J naught then call the oracle OP to obtain its neighbor J1. The reason is OP describes the sparse structure of the Hamiltonian. So it also describes the, how J0 is connected to its neighbor uh, in this graph. Then what about the weight on this edge? The weight is given by the entry of H. So it is uh, given by accessing the H by the oracle OH. Now, if you have the J1, then uh, again, for the second steps of the work, you need to obtain J2. And this requires, again, a call to the Oracle OP. And the, for the weight, you need to call the OH. And split by the green line, the different calls to OP and OH are actually related. That means the second call to this Oracle actually depends on the first call to this Oracle. Now our goal is to 
split this dependence train to make it uh, implementable in parallel. Let's denote the target state as uh, this per side. Now, uh, I should mention that uh, here we only need to remember that uh, for the generating this path, we only need to call the Oracle OP, and for the weight, we only need to call the Oracle H. So the following uh, process will be split into two parts, into two stages. The first stage only involves the Oracle calls to the OP. We call it pre-work. But what is a pre-work? It maps a J0 state to a superposition. And this superposition does not involve any weight in H. So it is actually a superposition of all passes generated by R steps of unweighted random work from the J0. So there is no weight involved in this state. That's why we call it pre-work, because in the second stage, we will add back the weight, that is HJK, the entry of H into this state. This is the first stage. The second stage would be reweight. That is, uh, we start from the pre-work state and call the Oracle OH to add back this weight. Now, how do we add, add back this weight? We can compute a uh, entry of H, say HJK, then use the controlled rotation to adjust the amplitude of these computational bases. Uh, this, this stage only involves Oracle calls to OH. Now let's see how the second stage can be implemented with uh, in parallel. So one uh, one of the central idea is we need to split each calls to the Oracle OH. Now if you make a copy of each vertex along this path. If you copy J1, copy J2, and uh, this copy can be, can be implemented by C0 gate, then these pair of vertices are separated. And you can call these Oracle OH on these pair of vertices to add the weight on these edges. In this case, these Oracle calls to OH are separated and independent, so they can implement it in parallel. So now the second stage reweight can be uh, done with only a constant depth of queries to OH. Now the remaining question is whether we can implement the pre-work stage with O1 depth of queries to OP. This requires us to introduce the notion of uniform structure Hamiltonian. Actually, this uh, notion is, act is technically oriented. So it is not, uh, it is kind of artificial. The goal of our pre-work stage is to uh, generate a path of length R starting from a vertex J naught. So if you start from J naught, and you denote the t's neighbor of the vertex j in the graph by a function ljt, then we choose different neighbors along this path. Say if we choose the t's neighbor of the j0 vertex, we obtain j1. Then we choose the t1's neighbor of j1 to obtain the sec second vertex j2 all along this path. So the, uh, so to generate a pass from, from a vertex J0 according to uh, our choices of neighbors, it is almost uh, equivalent to find the destination of this pass given the choices of neighbors. Now, uh, the uniform structure Hamiltonian satisfy given the starting point J0 and the sequence of choices of neighbors on T0 to TQ minus one, the destination it's a function that it can be efficiently computable <laughs> with O1 depths of queries to OP. Note that this is not, uh, not the formal definition in our paper, but here we want to omit the details to give you a uh, intuition behind this definition. And this definition uh, is actually for technical reasons. So 
uh, is not very beautiful. But the bottom line is, you want to compute the destination of uh, of the whole path uh, efficiently in parallel. And the good news is, uh, in this definition, the uniform structure Hamiltonian still includes many Hamiltonians of practical interest. Okay. Now I will sketch the outline of the whole algorithm. We start from a uniform structure Hamiltonian H, then we O1 depth of queries to OP to access the sparse structure of H, and O1 depth of queries to OH to access the entry value of H. We can construct a parallel quantum work orbit QR in two stages, pre-work and reweight. With this QR, it offers an in parallel implementation of the monomial of HR with the proper factor. Then by parallel LCU, which we will not uh, get the detail here, because it is kind of uh, trivial. Um, we can combine these eight monomials into the target unitary, that is e to the negative i h t. Okay, uh, at this point, is there any question? Great. Uh, if there is no question, I will go on to the final section discussion, where we have two open questions. Uh, the first question is about reducing the complexity dependence on other parameters uh, by, parallel, by introducing parallelism. In our algorithm, we are actually using the parallel computation to reduce uh, complexity dependence on epsilon, but there are other parameters like the simulation time t. Actually, in the uh, previous work, which is not concerned about the Hamiltonian simulation by Atiyah and Aharo North, they study the faster forwarding of Hamiltonians. And this is a property that reduces the dependence on t uh, in, the, in the gate depths. And these properties is further explored in a recent work. But when they study this property, it is not, uh, they are not uh, concerned about the, the, the parallel Hamiltonian simulation. And in this work, they have proved uh, for general Hamiltonian simulation, a significant reduction on T is impossible unless under some complexity assumption. Uh, that means for general Hamiltonian simulation, uh, it is impossible to significantly reduce the dependence on T. But here we still ask this question uh, because we can make some restrictions on the Hamiltonian, like what we have done in our work. Uh, and even if we limit the class of the Hamiltonian we want to simulate, they might also include some interesting Hamiltonians. So this is the first question. The second question is about the space-time trade-off of the parallel quantum algorithm. In our work, we did not uh, explicitly count the number of ancillas used in the quantum algorithm. And this might be very large. Uh, so question to ask is how many ancillas might be, uh, is required for a significant parallel speed-up and whether we can obtain some trade-off between the depths and the size. Okay, this is the second question. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tim, uh, for the excellent talk. Uh, do we have any question? Uh, actually, uh, Dominic Berry has a question. Could you uh, have a look at the chat? Okay. Uh, let me see the chat. Okay. Uh, the question Can is you see about, the chat? Yeah, yeah I, I am checking the chat. The question is about uh, how to show that common Hamiltonians are uniform structure Hamiltonians. Okay, uh, 
um, actually we omit some details in defining the uh, uniform structure Hamiltonian because uh, the, f the first part is uh, we define the uniform structure Hamiltonian for a limited class of Hamiltonians and these class only involves one Hamiltonian with the structure being a uh, structure following some patterns. And then we extend the whole framework that includes a parallel quantum work and all the notions introduced in this work to a sum of these uniform structure, uh, uniform structure Hamiltonian. So these Hamiltonians include a sum of uh, local terms or a sum of Pauli matrices. So uh, the sum form would include many interesting Hamiltonians because uh, at least for, uh, because uh, at least for any Hamiltonians, you can decompose it into a Pauli sum. Although the number of the terms might be too large for uh, for efficient implementation, and uh, for the practical Hamiltonians like the molecular Hamiltonians, if you decompose the H into several Pauli sums with the Jordan weak a Jordan Wigner transform, uh, the number of terms will be limited in poly of n. That means the number of the terms might be not that large. So in this case, uh, complexity of our algorithm is still uh, acceptable. Uh, is this a good answer? Yeah, uh, if you have more, uh, other questions, please unmute yourself and uh, show up. If you are inconvenient to talk, uh, you can leave the comments uh, in the chat. Um, I have a brief question, um, maybe. This was already mentioned during the talk, but do you require uh, the ability to perform uh, perform gates or oracle queries between any pair of qubits, or can you group, or do you always only act on qubits that are now close to each other, not necessarily neighboring qubits, but if you assume that uh, you are running these parallel algorithms on a, on parts of on a big quantum computer, you wouldn't have some communication overhead or an overhead for moving qubits around. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, actually, in our algorithms, we are assuming each pair of qubits can uh, commute with each other. So, uh, so it is not directly applicable to the uh, quantum devices where only neighboring qubits are connected. Uh, this is a very good question. And it would be interesting to study if with only uh, neighboring connections, whether we can still achieve a parallel speed up. Thank you for pointing this out. Also, this uh, was a, oh, yeah. thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, I have a layman question. So suppose we have a, a bunch of uh, uh, disk devices available. So um, if you, you uh, using your uh, method, can we factor a larger, how large the uh, number when compared with a single, uh, using a single uh, disk device? Is it possible um, to increase the... Okay, uh, first of all, our algorithm is uh, a fault-tolerant quantum algorithm, so it might be hard to uh, consider how it, how it applies to NISQ devices. And um, as I guess as Maria has mentioned, 
uh, uh, since our our parallel model requires the community to any okay. two qubits. So if you have many devices, then you need to assume the com communication between each of the two devices had a, a similar cost of uh, controlling two qubits in one devices. So uh, I think uh, it could be hard to apply these algorithms in near term. Yeah, I think I agree. It's a, there is no free, uh, free lunch <laughs> and uh, we need uh, more work to, to do uh, yeah, in this direction. A theoretical readout now. <laughs> uh, any other question? If no, uh, let's thank uh, Jicheng again for this excellent talk. Thank you again. And uh, look much. forward to meeting you uh, in person in uh, Sydney, maybe next year. Uh, <laughs> this year, the situation is not so good, especially in Sydney. Uh, thanks again.